Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny in Colombo. This is our special presentation on uh, Sri Lanka's current economic wars. We're trying to understand um, what's going on uh, in the country where we are right now and more or less to talk about solutions uh, that would get us out of this crisis, um, not just to fall into another one, but actually give us uh, sustainable solutions that would uh, last a lifetime. Um, lots of erroneous policies, uh, even yesterday we spoke about uh, has led to uh, this particular point in our nation's history and here we are there's no point in trying to uh, rub salt on the wound we all know the crisis situation we are in right now power cuts uh, 13 hours 14 hours it, it continues to increase fuel uh, supply chain still not restored uh, as expected uh, because we can't pay uh, the dollars are not there in the coffers in order to do that we have to um, figure out where we're going to do. One of the ideas that has been floated by the government and more or less by liberal uh, economists in Sri Lanka is the fact that let's go to the IMF that would uh, help us to uh, get a package, a relief package that would address this issue. But uh, then again, the question arises, 16 times we've done this exercise and you, who's going to tell us that the 17th time is going to work? Uh, are we just uh, applying a patch that would just be for another five, six months down the drain and then fall into this again? Or would we actually think diligently this time around, be, be intelligent enough to apply something that would last a lifetime? Uh, in order to get uh, an economic perspective this time around, I am joined by Dr. Howard Nicholas. He is the Director and Senior Trainer at the Economic Training and Information Services here in Sri Lanka. Um, good to see you and welcome to the program. Uh, so, um, uh, we're meeting <laughs> in a very tough time for the country. Um, yes, we know uh, we don't have dollars in our coffers in order to pay for the essentials. So there is a cascading effect, um, which is stemming from the fuel uh, crisis because no fuel leads to uh, no uh, power, no power means uh, mm, uh, businesses cannot sustain their grow, uh, you know, rolling out their businesses on a daily basis. It's, there's interruption, which means they don't have good businesses to do. So this cascading effect continuously occurring. What is your current take? Like, what, how do you assess this whole scenario? Well, firstly, Mahesh, thank you very much for having me on the program. It's nice to be back in Sri Lanka. Yeah. It's some time that I've been here, uh, but I've been following, uh, not as intimately as if I was living here, but still I've been following. And I've been teaching quite a number of senior business persons, uh, owners of companies, senior managers. Uh, and one of the recurrent themes I have is you can look all over the world and you see a certain pattern. The pattern is this. All those developing uh, countries that are down the industrialization path, and I think I've given your program a chart to this effect, you can see that all of these countries, they have almost continuous current account surpluses as a percentage of GDP. So they actually usually have enough reserves to weather storms. There are instances where the reserves are not quite adequate, but that's rare. So in other words, this group of countries, they never get into balance of payments problems. Whenever there's a shock, they can ride the shock out. There's another group of countries that is not industrializing and this is a group that Sri Lanka belongs to. Now this makes Sri Lanka vulnerable and that's why on a number of occasions when we've been hit with a shock starting with the assassination, for my recollection starting with the assassination of President Premadasa, which is a political shock translated into an economic shock, Back in the then 90s. we end up having a balance of payments crisis. Reserves are depleted and we hunt desperately for money, for dollars. Usually that leads us to the IMF uh, and that has happened in the past. Again, it's being discussed now. 
IMF comes in, things are settled for a few years, but then we go back to square one. That is, we're still vulnerable, waiting for the next shock. And when the next shock comes along, again, we have the same problem over and over again. So it is a characteristic of all these countries. There's no exception. So you have one group. That Give us an example of another country just like this. So actually all of Sub-Saharan Africa. You, know, you can see they all have the same problem because they're all raw material producers. And what happens is when the global economy turns down, as it does every 7 to 11 years, we know that this is the business cycle, then raw materials are cut immediately. Prices fall and these countries get into trouble. Now, what happens is with the industrializing countries, they manage to weather that storm because they have accumulated reserves, but they also have the flexibility of their economies to move into different sectors. I'll just give an example of what happened in 2020. Now, everyone thinks the entire global economy was badly affected. Indeed, many countries were badly affected but not some of the East Asian industrializing economies. This was one of the best years ever for them. A country that I'm very familiar with is Vietnam. Vietnam has a diversified industrial base, so they're into manufacturing. And what they did was they switched in from traditional manufacturers, so they were exporting things like smartphones and refrigerators and other electronic items, they switched into home office equipment. Why? Because the whole of the West switched into home office work. And Vietnam, actually, their reserve situation grew exponentially, and their currency even appreciated against the dollar. Now, you know, we have Sri Lanka suffering, and Vietnam having the best year yeah. ever. And that is because they have built a very robust economy. And currently, you can see the gains they have made. Today, Vietnam has a greater export, uh, dollar export earning capacity than India, the whole of India. Vietnam has a population of 100 million, India 1.3 billion. Just eight years ago, Vietnam was in the same mess Sri Lanka was, you know, it had forex crises and so on. What happened in 2012, the government appears to have bitten the bullet. And they switched to this aggressive manufacturing oriented, export oriented manufacturing strategy. Bizarrely, I'm seated in front of uh, a Vietnamese interviewer on a business program. I couldn't understand what was going on. Why did they drag me in front of the television <laughs> cameras in Vietnam? And he's saying, now, Professor Nicholas, we've heard that in your lectures at the university, you're promoting export-oriented industrialization. And our government has just embarked on it. Can you explain what the likely benefits are going to be? And I told them, and this is my prediction, I maintain this prediction, that by 2030, Vietnam will have the same living standards as Singapore. By 2030. I told them, a lot of you are trying to migrate to the US and to the West. You're making a tragic mistake. You're in the best country in the world. Because I've never seen any country industrialize and grow richer faster than you are doing at this moment. Today, Vietnam is building electric cars, mm -hmm. state-of-the-art electric cars. What you just said uh, brings aloud, because uh, w if, if we are talking um, about Vietnam, as uh, staying in that example, what you said was that the crisis, the forex crisis, which we are undergoing right now, and in our case, we've undergone it several times in our history. 
but never made the changes required in order to uh, uh, you know change into an export oriented economy rather than, than an import oriented economy so the problem is uh, the the trade balance deficit that is the real problem for us because Sri Lanka if by any chance uh, we are earning hundred rupees we are buying stuff for more than 200 rupees. So where is that uh, extra 100 is going to crumb? Uh, that is simple you know, logic for anybody to understand. Now, why do you think we are not moving? Because the export-oriented part is occurring right now. We see from 2020 to 2021 to 2022 a massive increase in exports occurring, which is a positive trend. But where what is what what is the next step like where should be like if by any chance if you're saying vietnam had to take uh, uh the 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 the, the uh, what do you call this our pill in order to change from from bringing everything or, or doing how they do, do things we are now on that path uh, of exporting uh, highly now what else what else do you think that needs to occur for sri lanka to turn the curve well, it's not exports per se, but it's actually manufactured exports. And the reason is very straightforward. Manufactures allows diversification like no other product category. So I take tea. How can I diversify tea? Maybe organic teas, maybe you know, different types of tea. If you bring a tea producer here, they will. Mm tell you extensively how they could diversify, but it's always just a few different teas, and you have the vulnerability of weather and this, that, and the other. It's the same with any agricultural product. But manufacturing is a bottomless pit. You can go on endlessly diversifying. You know, you start in one area, you make different components for one particular item, let's take a smartphone, it has 107 different parts in it. You specialize in one or two of those parts, but then you move to the other parts and eventually build your own smartphone. And that's what has happened. Vietnam has done the same thing. They built different components for Samsung. And that is for not internal use, but, but with the exports. For exports alone. The point is, a definition of a developing country is a low per capita income. So the market is always very, very limited. It's very restricted. The global market is infinite, relatively speaking. What you have to do is start producing goods that actually are being bought by the middle classes, global middle classes. And those are manufactured items. We have the illusion that, well, we can't do that. Actually, any country can do it. Problem is that there are blocks, you know, especially from the Western countries. They block our manufacture exports. And that's where we have the limitations. Now, what Vietnam did, and this is very smart of the Vietnamese, they used the geopolitical situation. In 2012, the West decided they wanted to diversify out of producing in China. They needed to relocate a lot of their production. So they looked around, and of course, they're quite happy with the East Asian countries because these are better organized and uh, they have better infrastructure and so on. And they looked at Vietnam. And so Many, many European companies, many American companies started to shift their production into Vietnam. Vietnam plays the geopolitical card. But do you think Vietnam is not working also with China? No, of course they are. Many so-called Vietnamese companies are actually Chinese companies because the Chinese know that one day their exports are going to be blocked. You know, I mean, it's not officially blocked, yeah, but yeah. it's de facto blocked. Yes. We have at this moment a geopolitical situation which gives Sri Lanka a chance. Sri Lanka should use that opportunity. What is that? 
We know that, so after Russia invaded the Ukraine, basically the West is now going around the world trying to count who is on our side. You know, the Chinese obviously are doing the same thing, the Russians are doing the same thing, the Indians are doing the same thing. And Sri Lanka is one of those countries that oh. everyone is courting. Yeah. Use the situation. How, how, how exactly use this situation? I, I want to get into uh, that other conversation, which was very interesting for me to understand, because uh, if Vietnam uh, did it by themselves and not exactly try to get, I mean, they would have got uh, aid from various countries, but the IMF was not part of that entire <coughs> uh, discussion, was it? Or did no, it wasn't. And it's not the IMF's role in a way to help countries to industrialize. That's why IMF helps a country, three or four years later, the country goes back to the IMF. I mean, this is the system. So they've, they've done it <coughs> in a manner uh, rather not, not, not helping them to uh, cure the uh, uh, sickness. It's more or less, you know, patch it up. So, you know, as you will come back to me kind of a scenario. Exactly, I mean, to some extent, I don't think that's their job either. You know, the job is for the country. Essentially, it's up to the country to undertake a long-term strategy. What can be a problem is some of the IMF policy recommendations damaging that long-term. So I, I'm going to give this example. I've given it in the past, but I will repeat it again. I was very, very critical of the privatization of the NDB and the DFCC. Why? Because we use those two development banks for our ag aggressive government strategy, something that worked and catapulted Sri Lanka upwards. And that those privatizations were demanded by, let's say, the IMF and the World Bank. It wasn't only the IMF as part of a structural adjustment strategy. And we had to accede to them in order to get the <coughs> required support. Now, that was actually damaging because yeah. we know from all successful countries, and there is actually no exception. You go through any East Asian country, at the heart of every successful strategy is development banking. You know? and, and we know that. Now the question you have to ask is, well, why were our two very successful development banks targeted and privatized? You know, and there, for me, the job of the IMF is not to help Sri Lanka to industrialize. It's more or less for America to thrive and, and those Western nations to thrive. We actually uh, did a segment <coughs> on, on the other day about why the IMF was initially created soon after the World War uh, and what was the target uh, that they were given in order to do to open world economies around the world in order so that the American businesses, the surpluses that they created after the war with, with their companies in America could go back into these particular new markets and hence they not only just economically but politically also it helped them. So uh, we have been a pawn for many years when it comes to geopolitical events right now even you said a very good point but uh, where um, Russia is looking for friends, China is looking for friends, India is looking for friends and we are friends with all three so and here we are in a crisis so maybe uh, to utilize in a very tactful manner. <coughs> um, let's take a short commercial break. I wanted to uh, discuss more on, on, on our current uh, situation. Uh, I want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Howard, with regard to uh, what exactly um, does he think, because there is uh, uh, an immediate crisis that is unfolding on a day-to-day -day basis, power cuts, uh, no fuel, or all this, and that's having a very cascading event, very negative cascading event um, in the country. So I want to get his take as to how we can fix that, uh, plug that particular problem, and then move on to the longer-term solutions, because this, this like, um, this is an opportunity, whether you like it or not, to see it that way. This is really an opportunity for Sri Lanka to again um, you know, take the necessary steps to be a country that is developed. Uh, every day, if you want to beg, 
uh, if you if you want to you know talk about loans and be being indebted to the rest of the world then we can do what we are doing right now but if you really want to be like Singapore or the rest of the world that is developed then we've got to make that turn and I think this is a golden opportunity to do that let's take a short commercial break we'll be right back Welcome back, everyone. This is a spe uh, special presentation on Sri Lanka's economic wars. Uh, I'm in conversation with Dr. Uh, Harvard Nicholas, uh, the director and senior trainer at uh, Economic Training and Information Services Sri Lanka. Uh, doctor, we had a very good conversation about uh, Vietnam and how exactly they have changed. Uh, they went through the same similar crisis, uh, forex crisis, that are, that made them to think differently uh, instead of falling into that same pit over and over again, which they did, they too did uh, in in history. Uh, let's address the the issues we have at hand. Like earlier on, we have a sh short term uh, a crisis that needs to be managed immediately. And then, of course, the longer term policies which we need to set in tra uh, motion right now so we can uh, uh, reap the benefits later on um, down, down the line. Short term crisis, in my opinion, is a, a supply chain crisis that has pretty much cascaded into every industry because Sri Lanka has de been a dependent nation uh, on fuel. So you take away fuel we lose, I mean, what, that's exactly what we're seeing right now. You increase fuel prices, everything goes up. Price structures change. So fuel as a commodity is quite the deciding factor in this country. Now, a nation who is, who is having uh, a commodity that is pretty much, uh, you know, rattling them on, uh, in, in a palm of another nation when it comes to, uh, you know, that commodity of fuel, how are we going to address this crisis? Because if there is no shipment tomorrow, we are screwed. Mm -hmm. um, we might get uh, it tomorrow and then we will, you know, scuttle for another couple of days. And then again, we add mm, point uh, zero. Keep ha you can't keep doing that. Mm -hmm. one, one fine day, we really need to, you know, patch it up and try to find a solution. In your opinion, what do you think needs to happen right now and that has not happened. So obviously the problem, the immediate problem is a lack of foreign exchange. I mean, the fuel is there if you have the money to buy it. I mean, so the problem is that Sri Lanka doesn't have the money to buy it. Now, I was uh, invited uh, as a panelist at a recent, it's the International Chamber of Commerce in Sri Lanka they had uh, the new governor, uh, Governor Nivad Cabral, was asked about what this present government is going to do to address the problem. And I was encouraged by his answer. And his answer went along these lines. He said, well, what we're going to try and do in the first instance is get bilateral finance. And he even went as far, at least this is my recollection, but he might correct me and say, no, no, you misunderstood. But my recollection was he said that one of the things we were going to try and do is liquidate some of the international sovereign bond positions so that we don't have that sort of Damocles hang hanging over our heads in the future. I was really encouraged because I would also say the first recourse should have been to bilateral financing on concessional uh, rates. And there, my view would be you have to link it with productive activity. So you don't just go with the begging bowl to somebody, but rather you cut deals with them not deals, trading assets, you know, giving them assets and they give us the foreign exchange. No, 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 that's not the deal I'm looking for. Rather, I would say, look, we have 
highly educated workforce. We have certain structures that are amenable to bringing foreign investors here, producers. Why not diversify some of your production to Sri Lanka? Because we're small. You know, we don't need that much production. But then you couple the borrowing with uh, infusion of production activity. Uh, just to put it into layman's term, what you're saying is, let's say if we are going to China for a bilateral uh, uh, agreement, instead of telling, please give us $5 billion, please give us X na y, uh, sum of money, we need to say is apparently we can provide you the manufacturing efforts of this X, Y, and Z products in Sri Lanka at the moment, and you can bring in your plants, and for that we will provide these types of concession fees, so that, exactly. that would, so this is uh, beneficial for both nations. So exactly. how, how would that address the current issue? Well, it addresses it immediately because you get the foreign exchange. I mean, so it has to be tied to the borrowing. But it's not just a concessional loan and let's say there are geopolitical implications for China and so on. No. I mean, there will be, but we must go one step further. We must say, look, we would like to have some joint ventures. We would like, so just thinking out aloud, China has 107 electric uh, car companies. Some of these are now starting to penetrate the East Asian market. They haven't yet gone into the European and North American markets, but they will at some point in time. And they will need lots and lots of supply chains. Now, Sri Lanka could be part of that because we have a great geopolitical location. So this location is perfect for them to have a production base. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it'll take that much. Uh, again, I go back to Vietnam because Vietnam, what they did was they invited Samsung and they bent over backwards. They did something so ridiculous. I mean, it seems absurd when I say it, but they had a, a special immigration line for Samsung people. So basically, they <laughs> said, you know, just go through. In other words, they did everything to get Samsung there. Why? Because Samsung is such an important company globally, and the Vietnamese were going to learn from Samsung. They wanted the technology transfer and the market access. And for, I mean, Vietnam is 100 million people, but Samsung is a monster multinational. You just, it was the one company that really changed everything in Vietnam. And if you go to Ho Chi Minh City, there's a whole area, region, a huge region, which is just for Korea. <laughs> yeah. It's called Koreatown, yeah. in a way. But they've now done the same with Japan. Exactly the same. And there are lots of Japanese companies following suit. Because once one multinational like Samsung is there, then others follow. Th right now, even I mean, if you are if you are thinking out loud, uh, you know, uh, Apple is di diversifying from China to India, and uh, we can actually <coughs> go to India and say, okay, if, if there is one product you are doing, uh, why not take one component of that, we'll produce it here for you, and that kind of that kind of uh, create opens the door. I think we try to do that with uh, Google, but it never never materialized during the previous regime. Um, that is absolutely a good way to think and do now. In order to do this, there are lots of other elements that needs to come into place. For one thing is political stability. We can't have governments changing, changing, changing. So does the economic policy changing, 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 which is which is Sri Lanka's problem. For 73 years, we've changed five years, five years, or 10 years, five years, 10 years. This is where we keep changing it. No successive government, or even the people of this country, has voted for a uh, for a government that has promised to towards continuity of a certain policy. I think that should be something that the voters w need to be looking in the future for them to understand. Okay, which government is continuing this good project rather than you know uh, getting getting 
caught into this rhetoric of things which happened um, back in uh, 2015. The Port City project would, if it was established, and by now there would have been a certain number of investors that would have helped this crisis to, to pass. Um, what do you think, like, in terms of Sri Lanka's overall, the longer term goal, um, in order to make that change what Vietnam did? Right now, where should be uh, or should we lay the bricks in order to get that entire structure formed? Um, and what are we doing wrong right now? Well, one of the, th the important things to note about Vietnam is it doesn't have a democratic system. Okay, so that's why th there's no problem with continuity. But for countries that are democracies, there is another constant which needs to be appreciated and that is the role of the business community. A really good example is Germany. So the business community in Germany tells the different political parties, look, we don't mind who comes into power, but you continue this industrial strategy. That means they have a stronger voice. They have a very strong voice, they're very powerful because they all work together. So if you bring Sri Lankan business groups and there is a consensus that this is the long-term strategy and whichever political power party comes into power, they have to follow this strategy. Otherwise, we will make their life difficult. I mean, it shouldn't <laughs> be threatening <laughs> politicians, yeah, but, but it but should be understood. Reality, yes. It should be understood. So you can see this happening in a number of countries. Behind the scenes, it happens in Japan. Behind the scenes, it happens in Korea. And this is the continuity that you should really have in democratic systems where, you know, the business community together with civil so society organizations say, this is non-negotiable. You know, this strategy has served us well in the past. We continue this. We'll have nuances, you know, so maybe we'll have different social policies and education policies and so on but this strategy is very important and why it is important is this that we spoke about it earlier Mesh. the foreign uh, community is putting pressure on our government not to go down this path and if there's no countervailing pressure mm. then our government will definitely and we see that happening that. right now. And so what we need is this countervailing pressure, but an enlightened countervailing mm. pressure, not a parochial one. So, you know, you know, maybe you have the tea exporters wanting their little bit, and, and maybe you have garments exporters wanting their bit, and domestic producers wanting something else. One of the other things that was, uh, that was floating, uh, not, not during this crisis, but prior, was uh, how exactly we can unify uh, or, and streamline uh, when promoting, like if you take tea, tea could be coupled with uh, beverages, a soft drink, and that could be coupled with tourism's aspect of things, you know, like that. Do you think that that's a su successful model? Well. One thing that we have learned from the past is the government shouldn't get too involved in picking winners. You have broad strategy and you have incentive structures, but a crucially important element of it is you must make these companies competitive. Mm -hmm. So you give them support, you create the structures, but it's the survival of the fittest. So. Yes. Anyone who exports is a winner. The others are not so fortunate. So that's the broad strategy. Uh, but the government should not get involved True. beyond at the micro level. Sri Lanka is also a nation that gives a lot of incentives to its people. Um, I think it has come to a point where people do not appreciate the value of things um, because they get it for free or, or something, you know, money is thrown around. Uh, there is this also the gap between the rich and the poor is quite uh, alarming because if you take a, a litre of petrol, 200, uh, I think over 2, 250, um, the person who just drives and earns around 5,000 rupees a day by, by driving a three-wheeler is also paying the same rate. And a guy who is going in a, a Mercedes or, or, or a Land Rover 
uh, is also paying the same rate and it is very un unfair in, in terms of understanding because that person's like in, in an instant like this no fuel that person's life falls apart no fuel um, the the big guy is okay he will he will you know find some other means of uh, going through so there is that what do you think about this incentive culture is that hurting this country a lot it's um I mean, obviously, from my perspective, the incentives are the wrong incentives. You know, uh, I mean, often these are politically motivated. Usually, the incentives that you're speaking about come just before election time, yeah. and nobody ever gets rid of them afterwards, and then they become impediments for progress. But the thing that I would like to emphasize is the fact that, let's say at this moment in time, when we talk of the damage being done to the poorer sections, I'd like to highlight one thing in the IMF report, which I read recently, which they emphasize, which I think should be emphasized, is social safety nets. You know, because this type of inflation of food prices and basic energy prices as you just uh, correctly said, this is so destructive for ordinary people. There must be some relief given to them, and this should be a priority. You know, this is, it's not a question of uh, scoring political points or anything. This is just humanity. You yeah. know? I mean, we cannot allow this damage to the section of the population. Very quickly, uh, Doctor, we are running out of time. Uh, the IMF has is going to come back. It looks like it's going to come back, uh, uh, and it's going to uh, start its 17th program uh, with with the current government, who has not been uh, a, a frequent visitor to the IMF uh, like the previous other um, U UNP, UNF, and uh, um, yeah, those kinds of governments. Now here we are going back and apparently we are not in a stronger position to dictate the terms because we are vulnerable and we are on our knees. Uh, what do you think about the proposals uh, that might come up because that, it, we've seen like in countries like Argentina, Ecuador, um, even in Indonesia, and all these countries where the IMF has worked, they, they just ask like uh, two or three or four things uh, that must be done. T taxes need to go high, you need to uh, float your currency, um, things like that. You need to give, uh, you know, take away lots of incentives and, and, and tax certain uh, sectors. Uh, what do you think? Are we going to? 17th time is also going to be another failure for us. So, well, in a way, we're already in a difficult situation. So we're in a currency crisis. I mean that you can't avoid this. And no matter which government is there, which set of policymakers, it's a bitter pill. You have to take that bitter pill. But that's what I said that. There are two things that we have to bear in mind. One is we have to have a long-term strategy and whatever we agree to shouldn't be fundamentally destructive to that long-term strategy. So we should be cognizant of the fact that some of those things could well be damaging. I, I don't know if I mentioned this, I, keep, I told you earlier the privatization of NDB and DFCC yeah, yeah. was one of those things we should never have done we should never have agreed to. There could be similar such requests made. You know, so we have to be aware that this could do damage to our long-term possibilities for industrialization. That means the government has to be very prudent and not have just blind faith in this institution because that institution, one of the things I really don't understand is uh, most of these liberal economists in uh, Colombo says that you know, it's going to build the investor confidence, uh, but I don't understand uh, how that is going to build, like for a simple example, if I'm an investor from outside of Sri Lanka, wants to put my money into Sri Lanka, the first thing I would do is to study this country. What is the benefit? The first thing I would look at is, will I make a profit? That's, that's pretty much I want to know. I, we can figure out the rest. So in order to make a profit, uh, is it easy to do business? That would be the second um, thing. And then the third thing would be, okay, how, how safe is my money in this country if I put it? 
Now, in that instance, if you go back and see our financial history, all that, and we see, you know, 16 times we've gone to, gone to the IMF, we did not listen to them. <laughs> Obviously, that's no idiot. Uh, but, you know, we say, oh, yeah, 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 17 times they're going to listen to I mean, that is not logical, uh, doctor. So I don't understand how that's going to build, but I understand, you know, in the olden days, how they do business, you know, uh, stable institution comes says you know okay we are with this kind of guys and the rest of the people come that is the old way of doing business now the world has changed so much startups are coming one after the other and those startups are not uh, uh, you know wanting to stay for 50 60 70 years they want to make the quick buck the quickest way possible uh, that is the reality or am I, am I completely off here no no I don't think so I, I, I you know what you have in Sri Lanka is actually a great entrepreneurial class. It's, it's always underestimated, but I am so amazed at young entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka and their dynamism and their determination to succeed. We don't harness it. This is the problem. We don't harness it. We don't do what the East Asians do. The support that they give is, is unimaginable. And by From comparison- the government or? The government. Of course, the government gives the support. And they do it in ways that bypasses all the international regulations. Mm -hmm. you know? So let me just give an example. Now it's not so easy to use development banking. So what have these stations done? They use municipal authorities. You know? They're bypassing. They're doing the same thing. And not just they. Look at what India is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you study what some of the states in India are doing, they're attracting all these car companies from all over the world. And how are they doing that? Well, they're giving them infrastructure facilities, they're giving uh, the counterpart companies concessional financing. Where? Municipal authorities, you see, because that bypasses a lot of the WTO regulation. Now, what we need to do is play smart. Exactly. Play smart. Uh <laughs> and give the entrepreneurs a what chance. Exactly. Um, while I keep my fingers crossed in being smart for this nation, but you know, let's see how it goes because apparently we know, we've been known to make the uh, absolute wrong decision at the uh, wrong time when we need to take the right decision uh, at that particular moment. Uh, we have to leave it at that, Dr. Howard Nicholas, uh, the Director and Senior Trainer at the Economic Training and Information Services, Lanka, really appreciate it. Uh, it has been a very eye-opening uh, discussion, uh, Doctor, which gives us a very good global perspective and the very uh, example you said that Vietnam went through the same thing and they changed which means there is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for Sri Lanka it's not always uh, doom and gloom and, and these types of economic uh, you know renaissance and then uh, in the depths it, it's it's part of the whole uh, economies that that keeps happening if you look at all over the world this is what the trend is so we just have to be prudent and plan uh, accordingly in case we are facing a tough situation we have some kind of reserves to fall back to and then uh, have the ability to come back I think what we didn't do that and here we are the very tail end of things uh, once again dr. Howard Nicholas thank you very much for your time pleasure is mine. well that's all the time we have for you tonight uh, thank you very much for watching uh, the news continues right here on Under the Internet 24. Good night.